Welcome to Disruption Dialogues Podcast Season 2. Listen to the influential leaders and trailblazers from around the world as they share invaluable insights to navigating the fifth industrial revolution. A very good morning to you all. I welcome you to M&M's podcast series. In today's episode, we'll deep dive into the transformative journey towards a cleaner and more sustainable future of transportation. I'm your host. My name is Sarwan Singh. I am Chief Commercial Officer and President at Markets and Markets. In today's episode, we'll explore the latest innovations, policy initiatives, and industry trends shaping the shift towards low carbon mobility solutions with a particular focus on the rail sector. We'll discuss different technologies from hybrid to electric to hydrogen, both for inter and inter- intra-city mobility solutions and for personal and freight mobility solutions, both in the developed and emerging nations. Transport accounts for 24% of global energy-related emissions and more than 80% of people living in cities are exposed to air pollution levels that exceed the World Health Organization limits. The rationale for decarbonizing transport is clear an investment gap has been identified but the critical question is, can the governments and corporations make that transition to zero emission mobility across all modes, road, rail, and air? Today, I'm joined by Lars Lovenstein, Senior Vice President of Siemens Mobility, Siemens. Lars is an exceptional individual with over 20 years of work experience in mobility in diverse roles, both in engineering and commercial. Lars recently took over a new role and now heads the new global zero emission business for mobility within Siemens, and is also responsible for the global metro business since 2018. With a deep-rooted passion for mobility and an unwavering dedication to serving Siemens customers, Lars exemplifies a commitment to excellence. Thank you, Lars, for joining us today. Well, Sawan, thank you very much for having me today. Lars, let's start with energy transition and shift to zero emission. As we delve into this topic of energy transition, one key aspect is the shift to zero emission transport solutions. From policy frameworks to infrastructure development, what key factors do you believe need to be addressed in your opinion to accelerate the adoption of sustainable transport solutions on a global scale? Excellent question. So first of all, to respond to this, it's all about openness to different technologies. All those technologies we are now observing, from hydrogen, batteries, all the blended intelligence we have in there, so something like smart grids, it's fast evolving. It's not really set. So it's too early to decide. It's too early to select. So first of all, we need to have this openness for different kind of technologies. And second, there has to be no silos. If we start thinking in silos, something like separating heavy-duty trucks, trains, aircraft, ships, when we do a big mistake. It's all about getting those elements interactive, scalable, and therefore available. It's all about ramping up. It's all about making it happen. It's pretty sure fossil energy-based systems are fading. That's for sure. New countries coming up to become the source of energy for the world in the future. And we have to be open to this. Just a very brief or simple example from politics. We do have a lot of discussion about ramping up new LNG or hydrogen terminals at our harbors. We didn't have this in the past for having new oil harbors. So we need to be open. We need to go for the transformation. And that's where politics can ease the pain for making it happen and accept that technology will evolve over the next couple of days and years. Thank you, Lars. Talking about technologies, between hybrids, electric, hydrogen, you know, we have a huge portfolio selection to you today. Do you see um, any specific technology or technologies being used and do they differ between intra and intercity rail solutions? Well, as mentioned before, we should not be in the position to decide today. It's no either or. So on the one side, everybody agrees that electrification is best in class. Electrification is best in terms of efficiency. Efficiency is the key element to be more or less sustainable. It is well proven, but it's not applicable in all different modes of transportation. So there will be at least one significant element, and those will be the batteries. Those are the batteries. They are the key to unlock all other technologies. Batteries are perfect to provide power when needed, but they are sometimes lacking behind if it's about energy. And there comes the fuel cell, there comes the the hydrogen into place. 
Fuel cells are perfect in dispatching, providing energy, but short-term power is quite an issue. Hybrids like internal combustion engines combined with batteries, for instance, or even utilizing hydrogen as some kind of fuel source, they might be a good bridging technology, but this is not the end of the storyline. And as you already mentioned, is there some kind of differentiation for our specific businesses in freight or in passenger service? Not really. It's not about freight or public transportation. It's more or less a question of distance to be traveled. Just imagine your, your vacuum cleaner, your vacuum cleaner robot at home. It's perfect to serve a local area based on batteries. Grab some energy, do the job. And this is the picture we have to transfer also, for instance, to freight for shunting services. We are in a local area. We can grab energy every time needed. We don't need to travel far distances. So the technology needed in here for shunting, for local distribution of freight, is same as we do need for local transportation of passengers. So it's supposed to be in the direction of battery. Of course, if we go long distance, the answers will be different. Thank you, Lars. Totally agree. And, 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 and we agree with your view. Uh, our analysts see, you know, for example, hybrid trains being used, maybe the number of hybrid trains even increasing. And like I think, remember, I remember when we talked last time, you also mentioned that perhaps for last mile, when they come to a city, you will move to hybrid or electric application. Do you see those kind of also solutions in the future whereby the long distance part is done perhaps in a different fuel? And then when you come to the last mile or the first mile, it's done using hybrid technology. Well, I think in terms of a bridging technology, yes, indeed. So you're perfectly right. We will have those, those hybrid solutions, for instance, leaving New York City on batteries, on zero emission, then go on diesel for the long distance and then approaching Los Angeles, you go back on the zero emission. So this is a bridging technology and this will be available to the market pretty soon because this is the answer as some kind of a first step. But there has to be a second step. And talking about the second step, long distance, um, I'm truly convinced that there the answer will be hydrogen. Just to give you some more some more insights on this. Today in those locomotives covering North America, whether it's either it's Canada or North America, or whether it's it's America, we usually have a couple of 2,000 up to 3,000 gallons of diesel on board. If we are on the way to replace this with hydrogen, we are talking about approximately three up to four metric tons of hydrogen. The clear answer is we cannot do this on a gaseous way. We need to have liquid hydrogen, and then we have sufficient space to store the energy to really cross from East Coast to West Coast to cross the United States. We cannot do this on batteries. Even with the most advanced battery technology today, the weight of those batteries to cover at least one third of the energy would be beyond 100 metric tons. So it's a clear way forward short distance will be batteries. There are products out there already that serve as a battery train those distances and the long distance will be on hydrogen. That's the way forward from my point of view. Thank you, Lars. And just talking about batteries, do you see any specific battery technologies being preferred in the rail sector? We know in automotive, the Chinese love the LFM, LFP, Tesla likes NMC. Is there a divide in the rail sector or is it a bit more harmonized? There is a divide in the rail sector for sure. And it's once again, uh, it's all about the application. So first to be mentioned, the numbers of cycles we do need in the rail sector are way beyond, way higher than we do see in the automotive industry. It's a very simple reason. Those trains, they are live, they are operating 24 seven. They have no time where they at any kind of garage. So from the 365 days, it's 360 days at least of operation. For the local trains, for the ones really getting inside the cities with high frequent stops, we do see LTO as the best solution today because it's providing more cycles, more stability than NMC does. If we go for the medium distance, so some 50, 60, 100 miles, then NMC usually plays the bigger role due to a higher energy content. So there is the separation. It's about the frequency of utilization. It's about the distance to be traveled. And that's why we do see in rail LTO and NMC today 
as the most leading technologies. You mentioned LFP. Yes, indeed. Uh, the upcoming LFP versions, we do expect them in a heavy duty version in 2025. They might replace LTO because they also at least announced to be as stable in terms of cycles, providing more energy. And due to the fact that they are in automotive, the price level is way beyond, so way lower than we see in LTO today. And there we're really talking about factor seven today. I would expect personally a drop in prices in respect in regards to LTO of more than a factor of five. So that's the future. But today rail is based on LTO and NMC. Thank you, Lars, and totally agree with it. And uh, I do agree also with you on the pricing. You know, today LFP is the cheapest technology, but I think others will catch up. Um, just st staying a little bit on fuels and technologies, do you see um, any other um, fuels being used in the future? For example, solar or CNG or even synthetic fuel? Um, I don't see them really as an option. Of course, once again, we do have a large scale installed fleet. And for a lot of operators, it might be a way forward, at least to reduce their carbon footprint by bringing in any kind of, we call it e-fuels. But this is not the way forward that really uh, drives the, the difference. And there's a very specific reasoning behind. It's all about efficiency once again. We have to really take into account the well to wheel. So from the source of energy to the transportation, to the movement of the persons and goods. Um, as I mentioned before, electrification, if we really start at regenerative power and go down all the way until the train moves, we usually have an overall efficiency of some 75% roughly. If we do this with batteries, we are a little bit less that good. So I would expect some 65, 68% of overall efficiency. If we go down to the combustion engine, we usually end up below 20%. And if we now feed in those e-fuels, the situation even gets worse. And right in the middle, the bridging gap, once again, getting me back to hydrogen, we do expect well to wheel with a fuel cell based system, with a hydrogen based system in the range of 26 of 28 percent of overall efficiency. So now getting back to, to a higher level in terms of capex, it might be interesting to get those existing uh, combustion engines running on e-fuels. In terms of OPEX, which is the more dominant part in all these transportation efforts, it doesn't make the day. So from that point of view, there will be a clear way forward in terms of hydrogen as the energy carrier. Just one uh, final remark, of course, all in the business of rail have to think and are working on solutions to convert today's existing rolling stock into the future rolling stock. But as mentioned before, the focus is batteries and hydrogen. Yeah, Lars, totally agree. I think you're right. The total cost of ownership is is the end driver in the end. And and do you see that the total cost of ownership of hydrogen is comparable to electric? And and will it get better in the future as as we see costs coming down? That's that's a good one because this is really essential. Um, I would like to start with a very, let's call it. Uh, Simple, simple saying. Um, I do believe that energy in the future will be almost for free. We all started with our smartphones having limited amount of uh, megabytes and, and, and uh, data volume. And we've been really taking care of it because it was a precious good. Today, it's a flat rate because we do have the technology to make it happen for all of us. If we now see about all those regenerative power plants that are fast evolving all around the globe, if we look to North Africa, if we go to Latin America, those will be the sources of energy in the future for sure. And we do see prices for energy from those large scale producing, let's call it factories, of below one and a half US cent per kilowatt hour. And if we take this into account, convert it to any kind of carrier, whether it be hydrogen or even e-fuels, the price will significantly go down for the kilowatt hour as we do see today. So I personally expect hydrogen in the range of maybe two, two and a half US dollars per kilogram at the port in the near future. Near future is below five years. Today, we already see prices in the range of five up to 10 US dollars per kilogram. 
partially gray hydrogen, I admit, but the directive given the plants that are more or less now under construction, they give us the way. So from that point of view, clear answers are, and yes, energy prices will be going down, transmitting those energies from A to B, whether it will be liquid hydrogen, LOHC, ammonia, or whatever you name, will be including some additional costs, but it won't make a big change. So energy will be available. We will have new partners globally providing the energy, and it will be sufficient, more than sufficient. And this will be really boosting all the transformation towards zero emission. Thank you, Lars. Uh, I'm glad you used some figures there because I was going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you said um, hydrogen is about five dollars per kg, and that's exactly our view too. Uh, and but we believe that half of that is production, and half of that is transportation, conversion, reconversion. So that leads me to the next question. Uh, you know, maybe with hydrogen, we won't see what we see with the LNG or CPG that you can transport it from Australia to Europe. So we believe you will see the growth of what we call micro economies. In other words, in future, rail way stations, ports, even airports could generate hydrogen on site and consume it on site because you can't be transporting it hundreds and thousands of miles from each other. Do you agree with that assessment? Do you think railway stations in the future could also become energy producers? Fully agree with this assessment. We will have some kind of a decentralized availability of those carbon neutral energies. So the major consumers, the large scale consumers, they will foster these local transformations. Either it will be ships, rail or aircrafts. They will enable local communities to be at least operated on hydrogen and what I do uh, mean with operated on hydrogen if you have cars, buses, trucks, even private homes for heating, they will benefit from those large scale consumers. From our point of view today, if we have a community of approximately five up to six hydrogen powered trains, this is sufficient to have a local electrolyzer, large scale electrolyzer loaded not fully loaded, but loaded in terms of operating it entirely or throughout the day, having about some 60, 70% of the energy produced for the trains and having the rest of the energy available to other uh, modes of transportation or heating systems. So from that point of view, clearly agreed. The one thing I would slightly disagree is about the distance uh, where hydrogen might become available. So I do think that those early approaches of having liquid hydrogen shipped, for instance, from, from Australia to Japan, this is an evolving technology and might also be an answer to provide energy from North America, maybe not to Europe, but also to the southern parts, from Latin America to the southern parts of America, and also from North of Africa towards Europe. So it will be some kind of a game changer at all. And of course, I do believe that Australia will be the source of energy, especially in the direction of Japan. Thank you, Lars. I agree. So I want to pick up on two things you mentioned in that. So again, really enjoying this conversation here, Lars. Firstly, you talked about electrolyzers. Do you see any specific type of technology, hydrogen technology, and solid oxide or electrolyzers, which will be preferred in rails? Well, um, Today, we are mostly focused on PEN. But as I mentioned at the very first statement, we need to remain open according to technology. Uh, it's really a fast evolving situation. Um, we cannot judge today. PEM seems to be in the lead, or PEM is in the lead today, but I'm not willing to state today that this will last for the next 10 years. So from that point of view, I think we need to remain open and to really observe different opportunities. Once again, it's all about CapEx and OPEX. That's the driving force. And technology is, sorry to say, only second place in terms of the decision making process. Lars, and to be honest, we feel the same. We will have multiple portfolios of technology. Maybe we'll start with electrolyzers and PEMs and maybe China will lead with electrolyzer technology. And then we'll move into more sophisticated solid oxide. Um, so I agree with that. Um, Lars, you talked about geographies a little bit. Does the rail industry, and in particular, the journey to zero emission um, rail transport, differ by geographies? Is it different in emerging economies versus developed economies? 
Well, I do see some hot spots in terms of transition phase. So on the one hand side, Europe has started the transition, especially for public transport. So we do see a lot of rail systems already in service based on batteries, based on hydrogen. So this was a really kick-starting event for Europe. And now recently, uh, the other hotspot, and I have to, have to admit that this way forward is really, really exceptional. It's all about California. California, California Air Resource Boards decided now to set in place uh, an act, which is the so-called Local in Use Act, to ban diesel engines from trains starting next year. Every locomotive aged more than 24 years will be not entitled to be operated in California on diesel anymore starting January 1st next year. This is a benchmark. This way forward, this directive given is of course demanding for all players in the market, the operators, the manufacturers, but also for the, the ones providing energy. But it's a clear directive given now that we are heading as a community jointly in the direction of zero emission. So those are the two hotspots I would like to highlight. Of course, there's a lot of other things going on in terms of movement in the direction of zero emission. Not everything is that positive. For instance, if you take into account that every of those systems is more or less relying on some kind of a battery, battery as a key technology. Today's situation, batteries are mainly produced in China. So more than 70% of all batteries worldwide come from China. I do see activities in Europe, in North America, to at least get on a stable situation of having own sources in Europe, in North America. Target 2025 in a range of some 15 up to 70% of global battery production. This is the right answer because the key technology needs to be available at large scale around the globe. Another thing that makes me think, um, Chile recently announced that all future lithium mines will be under control of the Chile government. So this might become a little bit more restrictive to the market. At the same time, I do see answers, once again, Europe, North America, of also ramping up first or initial businesses on lithium production. So we need to be aware that all those transformation comes along with a significant disruptive situation for today's value chains globally. And we have to observe, observe this very, very carefully, not to fall apart and not to be dependent on just the one or the other country. Thank you, Lars. It's interesting, you know, California seems to be leading the charge when it comes to mobility and all forms of mobility, right, from cars uh, and into rail. So very interesting to hear. Um, Lars, a little bit uh, you mentioned in your uh, previous one of the questions about CapEx to OPEX. So I want to talk a little bit about new business models. Um, in my previous life for the last two and a half years or so, I was putting light, uh, I was putting electric buses in cities and I put about 500 buses on roads in India and we had another plan to put another thousand. And my role was to move the business model from CapEx to OPEX. It was an annuity type business model and it was a paper mile model and we connected everything, digital, um, the energy solution. We were even putting renewables to put in the 13 gigawatt of uh, power required, for example, in our operations uh, in a particular city. So I just want to ask you, are you seeing different business models also in the rail sector? Yes, indeed. So in the future, it will be more or less well, let's call it mobility as a service, energy as a service. We will have those new technology. They will have additional needs in terms of maintenance, but they also cause additional investments, not only on the rolling stock, but also on the infrastructure. From an operator's perspective, it's all about optimizing CapEx and OPEX, so total cost of ownership. So it will be all about having the mobility at a potentially fixed rate per kilometer, per mile, per passenger transported, made available. The technology risk over the next couple of years is still existing due to the fact that it's an evolving a new technology. So the way forward is supposed to be to have those mobility as a service made available to the operators to ease the situation of transformation uh, to get from the today's fossil-based system to the zero emission system. And this might be also a huge and great opportunity, for instance, for pension funds 
to enter this area. It is a long lasting business. It will remain in the cities for years, for decades. So it's from my point of view, a win-win situation of the ones willing to invest into zero emission, the ones willing to operate zero emissions, the ones bringing zero emissions into well daily service. And just to sum it down, that will be the storyline of mobility as a service, zero emission mobility as a service. I totally agree, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, in my previous life, I also saw sovereign funds, uh, pension funds, you know, find investing in this sector very lucrative because typically these are for buses, it was 12, 15 years, for trains it's even more. And, and for them, it's a good 10 to 30 percent project IRRs on these, so it's good return and it's, yeah, and it's it's less risky because, you know, people will always move. Uh, we, we, we are a society that likes to be mobile. Um, Lars, tell me a little bit about your role in Siemens. How is Siemens and you leading the charge of enabling zero emission public and freight travel? Well, for us at Siemens, we do have a large scale portfolio on products for mobility. Um, we decided years ago to move away from any diesel based systems. And now we are on the, let's call it final move. Our portfolio have been enriched by electrical multiple units for passenger transportation based on batteries, based on hydrogen. And now we are scaling up those systems towards the locomotive business. That's the answer from our side. Um, of course, we are partnering globally with companies providing such kind of zero emission components. And at the same time, we do have our colleagues from Siemens Energy to provide electrolyzers, to provide grid technology. So it's more or less a whole system we are on the way to, to provide to the market. And um, within this, let's call it new evolving ecosystem, um, I am, I'm honored to be the one to at least drive the change for the rolling stock. Thank you, Lars. Lars, uh, maybe coming to the end of the question. Um, when we were last talking, it was really incredible um, to hear from you a little bit about your personal passions. You, you love driving bikes, and I used to drive and uh, bikes. I was one of the first guys to go on the highest road in the world, in the Himalayas, on a on a on a 350 cc bike. And secondly, I believe you own a forest. So tell us a little bit about your passion, but also how do these passions help you or contribute to you in your business role? Well, that's that's truly a perfect match in between the both of us. Well, uh, downhill mountain biking, um, it's it's about getting yourself along a blocked, rocky path, steep decline, some 80, 90 uh, percent of decline. Well, it's it's not the best way to, well, keep yourself self. But the thing is, it's all about being focused to the point. It's all about you and the path. It's all about making it happen. It's a blend of adrenaline and focus. And this is really, well, a nice situation to me um, to at least, well, freshen up the mind and, and, and rethink things different. Second, and you mentioned uh, owning, owning forests. Um, well, that's about some kind of a passion to preserve. It's it's about getting out there at the weekends, early morning, uh, do some do some lumberjacking to at least take care, and it's really rewarding. It's something like you're out there. It's just about you. It's just about the task. And um, yeah, maybe last remark to this. Of course, legally spoken, I, I own forests, but honestly spoken, I'm just holding them for my kids. I will hand them over and. From my point of view, this is sustainability, and you ask about business, well, that's the picture I transfer to business. What we do is supposed to be sustainable, otherwise it's just a waste of time. Thank you, Lars. It's been so informative speaking to you today and learning from you. Thank you very much, and I look forward to riding in one of Siemens' fast trains in a completely zero emission carbon footprint. Thank you very much, Lars. Savan, so, thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for such an interesting discussion. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. I was in conversation with Lars Lovenstein, Senior Vice President of Siemens Mobility, C Siemens. Thank you, Lars, again. Stay tuned for such interesting episodes on Disruption Dialogues. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for tuning in. If you want to know how you can navigate and thrive in this disruptive era, subscribe to Disruption Dialogues on your go-to podcast channels and stay tuned for more interesting episodes.